Well, it looks like we had a computer crash while singing. I was going to say it's a perfect day to download the app. You can follow along with us there and get the notes and all the scriptures as well in the app is on the screen. So we've been in this series called Committed. We've walked through being committed to Jesus, committed to friends, and today we are going to talk about committed to marriage. So will you join me in prayer? Father God, we bow before you this morning, and I, I come to you, Lord, knowing there's lots of different things on my heart and my mind as I come into this place on a Sunday, and Lord, we cast all our burdens on you. Lord, you care for us, and we want to be here to be open, to lean in, to hear the word of God and be changed by it. So, Lord, all these other things, all these other distractions, Lord, we give them to you this morning. And we offer ourselves wholly to hearing the Spirit speak this morning. And Holy Spirit, I pray, I ask that you would be our teacher today. We know that Scripture is God-breathed, and the way that we receive Scripture is that spiritual instruction and spiritual hearing. So, Lord, would you help us in that today? And we know this is a prayer that you love to answer. So we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So it is true, I will admit, there are many a pastor, whenever you think about performing a wedding, when you think about performing a marriage ceremony, uh, you have this in your mind, right? the princess bride, and it is such a funny scene that you barely pay attention to what he's actually saying because you're just laughing at how he's saying it and what's going on in that scene. But if you were to go back and listen, he says, marriage is a blessed arrangement, a dream within a dream. And I think, what does that even mean? What does that even mean? A blessed arrangement, a dream within a dream, right? So it's perfect for a romantic comedy, of course, but many of you have been married, are married, or have seen marriages and realized marriage does not proceed like a romantic comedy. Joyce Brothers, who is a famous TV, radio, advice columnist, she was a psychologist, she once quipped that she and her husband never thought about divorce. Murder sometimes, but not divorce. It doesn't proceed just like a romantic comedy, right? And that's serious for us as we think about what does it mean to be committed to marriage. And I think many of you have maybe heard of Simon Sinek. He has this book, Start With Why, famous TED Talk. And he basically says, understanding the why transforms everything. So I don't really want to talk to you today about how to be married, how to be a husband or a wife. I want to talk to you about why marriage. What's the purpose of marriage? Um, One of the most often, speaking of ceremonies, one of the most often used liturgies for marriage is quoting Jesus in either Mark 10 or Matthew 19, where he says, the two shall be joined together, they'll become one flesh, and let no person pull them apart, right? That's the scene in the movies where somebody runs in to object. But this idea that the two would become one, it's a picture for us of what is occurring spiritually and emotionally and physically in marriage, but it still doesn't really get us to why marriage. And in our society lately, I've been hearing some statistics saying that divorce is on the decline, which would be good news, except that's usually connected with fewer people getting married. That's why there's fewer divorces. And so for some people, marriage, it's an outdated social institution. Why why even get married? For some people, it's a system of organizing cultures and societies that's just a historic relic to them. For some people, they would say it's a pattern that creates this hierarchy to govern homes. We would say, as followers of Jesus, who base everything that we think and do on the scriptures and the spirit, that it's so much more than that, right? And so when we think about the purpose of marriage, We look at the Bible from beginning to end, and we're going to do that today. We'll be here a while. It's okay. Not even that many laughs on that one, you guys. Um, So we are going to look at the whole arc of Scripture idea 
creation, the beginning, and then with Jesus, because some things do change over the trajectory of the story of God, but this one does not change. God has this purpose for marriage that we're talking about today. And speaking of looking at scriptures across a long range of the Bible story, so we're part of the Free Methodist family. This is a statement that we have on the nature of marriage. It's written, at creation, God instituted marriage for the well-being of humanity. So there's a why right there. Marriage is the joining of one man and one woman into a lifelong relationship of mutual love and service, which the scriptures call one flesh. Such a marriage should be based on mutuality and partnership, patterned not according to the prescribed hierarchies, but according to the creation of the male and female, both in the image of God and the call to mutual submission, as illustrated by Christ in his relationship with the church. So there's some why, some purpose to marriage. I think everything we do, and this applies whether you are married, have been married in the past, whether you will never be married, it doesn't matter. There is a purpose for each one of us, right? And there's that purpose for humans as God created us, and then there are unique individual purposes that are about how we were created by God, gifted, wired, the experiences we have. So all of that falls under one umbrella of purpose, really. If we were to look at the Westminster Catechism, which is a reformed catechism, there's a question in there that says, what is the chief end of man? Which means, what's the purpose of humanity? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's the answer. For us as Wesleyans, we look at that idea of glorifying God, right? Becoming holy is becoming mature and complete in self-giving Christ-like love, right? This is the purpose of all of humanity. And so marriage, of course, falls under that. It's another relationship in which we get to live out this kind of glory to the Lord. And so today we're going to be talking about a main idea. Marriage enables us to, gr enables us to grow in goodness and glorify God. Because God himself is love, right? This is his character. This is his nature. He can't act outside of that ever. God is love. And so this idea of glorifying God, there was a point as I was learning to follow Jesus, I'm like, what does that really mean? Like, practically, what does that mean? Somebody give me a better definition of to glorify God. And so I think I've shared this with you all before. One of the best ways for me to remember it is to give a correct estimate of who he is, to give a correct estimate, to reflect his immeasurable worth and value, right? To give a correct estimate of who he is. So for us in marriage relationships, we can glorify God by giving a correct estimate of the kind of love that exists. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Complete unity, complete harmony, complete shared purpose. So that's what we're talking about today as we walk through some of these scriptures. We are going to start in the beginning, man and woman, and we're going to be in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And we know that this creation story in Genesis, it is not chronological because the creation of man and woman is in here twice. It's in chapter 1 and chapter 2. So we're going to look at chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, right? This is our triune God speaking, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. This is why we hold deeply to the conviction that every human being has dignity and worth. Every human being, male, female, every race, ethnicity, right? Every human being has this value made in the image of God. They bear his image. And so, in verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So he created this man and woman, 
and he gave them purpose. Did you see it? He gave them purpose, and he gave them purpose together. In the image of God, representing who God is, male and female, they have this purpose. They are to steward all of creation, and they are to govern the earth, which is basically saying, with God's authority, rule over this place this incredible creation that I'm giving you. And so for us today, if we want to grow in goodness and glorify God in our marriages, we do this by pursuing purpose together. We do this by pursuing purpose together and putting it in this perspective, the bigger picture, that we live to glorify God, right? And so here, God's saying, I'm I'm creating this and I'm giving it to you to rule over. Has this changed with Jesus that we would pursue purpose together as spouses? No. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. All these things that we each individually worry about, all these things that we want to make happen, see happen, be right about, all these things that are a part of our kingdoms when we sit on the thrones of our hearts. Instead, God has given us this unified purpose together. And so the story goes on in verse 15. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. Sorry, this is chapter 2. Now we're in chapter 2. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Work is also not a cursed thing, friends. It was the goodness of God's creation that we would have work to do together. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So here's God creating all this goodness, and he's looking at all these elements that he has created, and he's calling them good. But for Adam, the man, who's still alone, it's not good yet. It's not good yet. The goodness is expressed in male and female. God says it's not good for you to be alone. So I will make a helper suitable for you. A helper suitable for you. Now this phrase has caused all kinds of trouble for people. And so in 1611, the King James Version of the Bible translated these Hebrew words that, and I'm going to have them put these words up on the screen. It's two words that in the NIV say helper suitable. In the King James Version of the Bible, they translated it help me. Help me. And with our contemporary modern thinking, we look at this and we think that that person just exists as an inferior to a superior. But these words, azer kenegdo, we're going to talk about them for a second because they give a beautiful picture of marriage and man and woman. So the word azer, it was in, even in the King James Version, there many times, over 20 times, and only twice did they translate it, help me, in this passage. Every other time it was just translated help or helper, And almost all of those 22, it depends on how how you count versions of the word, but almost all of those 21 or 22 times, the word azer refers to the Lord. So Psalm 33, 20, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help, azer, and shield. Psalm 121, 2, my help, azer, comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So clearly, friends, this isn't creating some kind of idea that the help, the azer, is this inferior being that just exists for the sake of the other, right? If the Lord is an azer, the Israelites used to name their children using this word, like Eliezer is a name you would find in the Old Testament. It means God is our helper. They named their sons after this, right? So this position of azer, this idea of a strong helper. In many cases, it's a military helper, actually, in the Old Testament. And then kenegdo, this idea of a suitable helper. What was really being said here? So the word kenegdo, it means in a more literal way, as in front of him. He created a woman as in front of him. And so it's been translated corresponding 
But here's the beauty of it, face to face. Face to face. He created a helper face to face. And face to face, friends, is that condition of intimacy that we talked about last week for friendships, that husband and wife face to face pursue purpose together. So this is the next thing we're learning from what God called good that we want to continue to reclaim and grow in. We are growing in that and glorifying God by seeing your spouse face to face. We pursue purpose together face to face and intimacy and purpose. We are made as a match for one another because we complete the image of God. It's an incredible picture. And when I went through this this week, I kind of took a quick catalog of how much time did Dave and I spend this week face to face. It's kind of a sobering moment, but intimacy, pursuing purpose together in that union and that connectedness that God calls good, for husbands and wives, it requires face to face. It requires that kind of connection to create the intimacy and the, uni the unity that we're talking about. So in chapter 2 then, we read when we get down to verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one. Right? So this idea of marriage, this concept of covenant, man and woman, is recapturing the unity of goodness, of shalom, of harmony, Right? This is the reconciliation that occurs even cosmically when people would live in this kind of marriage. So as we're reading this, this was the part that I said is quoted often in wedding ceremonies. The part that we find here in Genesis 2 is quoted by Jesus. And so for us, that just reaffirms that the nature of marriage hasn't changed from creation to what Jesus is still proclaiming as God's purpose for us to live this way. And so they become one flesh, and the next sentiment there recorded for us is that they are naked and not ashamed. Adam and the woman, wife were both naked, and they felt no shame, right? This is a condition, a key condition of intimacy. And so many of us, we deal with issues of shame through our lives that Jesus wants to set you free from. He wants to restore you to that feeling, that knowledge. It's not just a feeling. It's a knowledge that in Christ, because of the blood of Jesus, we can actually be laid bare before God and seen as good and laid bare before our spouse. Right? This is that intimacy so that we can pursue purpose together face to face in this relationship. But... We know there's a but coming. Many of us, many of us have, have read into chapter 3 before. Just a few verses. This harmony, this unity, this beautiful shalom, the goodness of the garden is disrupted. Because a, ser a serpent goes to Eve and basically says to her, you know what, God's holding out. He's not giving you all the goodness he's got. He causes them to doubt that what they had was really good. And so in that doubt, disbelief, there's disobedience. They choose to eat of the fruit that they had been commanded not to. And in verse 7 we read, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Shame has entered. The relationship between man and woman and shame has entered the relationship between the humans and God. Verse 8 says it. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Sin is the source of shame. Sin is the source of a curse on the world. 
pure goodness and love is tainted from this moment on. So marriage, the union, the intimacy is a restoration, right, of that feeling of being naked and not ashamed. That's the intention so that we can live as redeemed people. And we're going to talk more about this. God, in verse 14 then, he curses the serpent. In verse 16, he says to the women, this is, this is the result of sin in the world. I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. Do you see it, church, what happened here? The purpose together, the face-to-face, -face, both of them right here, disrupted by sin in relationship now. And so when we read this, rather than living in the blessing, remember God looked at them and blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, rule over the earth, steward it. Rather than living in the blessing, now they have to live under this world fallen and cursed. In one essay by the Free Methodist Study Commission, it says, now she will desire the man, but the man will rule over her. This hierarchical pattern characterizes human history from that point on and manifests the consequences of human sin. When we grow in goodness, when we are being restored to what was in the garden at the beginning, right, we are not under this curse. We are not under this curse any longer. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus and now called blessed. So this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it disrupted everything, but God offers us, he invites you to eat of a different tree, the fruit of the tree of life, right, where we are being restored to that goodness. And so in our marriages, if we want to glorify God and grow in that, we do that by reclaiming the blessing and rejecting the curse in our relationships, in our marriage. We don't accept the curse as redeemed people. We get to live under the blessing, right, that God intended for us. There's a few theologians that seem to claim it was their phrase first, so I can't really tell you whose it was, but there's this phrase that the gospel is a stick of dynamite in the social structure. The gospel is a stick of dynamite in the social structure. So let me give you an example that you would connect with, right? In the 20th century, we had all these totalitarian dictators, right? The ultimate evil of power in those systems, in those people, in those governments. And you know what they really hated? Christianity. Really didn't like the power of the gospel in people's lives, people who knew that they could live free, people who knew that they could escape oppression, people who knew that they didn't have to bow down to a human dictator, right? So the gospel in those situations is a stick of dynamite in that kind of social structure. And I want to remind you that when Jesus came, when he stood up in the temple and he opened the scroll of Isaiah and he read from it, and he said, I am here to proclaim good news for the poor, freedom for the prisoners, sight for the blind, and liberty for the people who are oppressed. What he was saying is that sin in the world created these power dynamics, created these hierarchies where people are oppressed, but I'm here to set you free. So church, in our marriages, we can live as free people, Reclaiming the blessing, not cursed people, right? Who have to live in these dynamics where people are always out for themselves because that selfishness breaks the unity, breaks the harmony that God wants for us, right? Shalom is about self-giving love. So when we look in the New Testament, there are two really well-known passages about marriage. Ephesians 5 is one of them. Colossians 3 is the other. They're very similar. They're parallel. Ephesians 5 is a little more fleshed out 
for us. So we're going to be in Ephesians 5 this morning. And when scholars look at that, they see Paul using kind of a pattern or a template from what were called Roman household codes. So they knew about this in their culture. This would have been something that people were familiar with, these household codes, because in their society, only men and property-owning men, usually, had rights and privileges according to the government. They were the only ones that interacted with the government. And so everybody else was considered under them. And so in the household, the leader of that household, the man with the rights, was then supposed to govern the household. So they had these household codes. And what Paul is doing here is subverting the old system by saying, no, there is something different because we don't have to live by the poisoned fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Instead, we live according to the good news of the gospel. And so because of that, we have a whole different pattern for relationships, marriages in Christ. So in Ephesians 5, 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Do you see it, friends, what the center of this relationship is? It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. And so as we grow in holiness, wholeness, as we are sanctified in love, what we do is we start to bend and incline always to submit to Jesus, right? So what happens if you've got two humans a husband and a wife bending and inclining and bowing to Jesus, it means they're going in the same direction. And so Paul is saying, both of you submit to Christ. And that means both of you, so wives, submit to your husbands, right? Submit to your husbands. And then he starts to talk about husbands here. And when he says... Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He's talking about sanctification, right? He's talking about how both... Is anybody married here that has found out that marriage is a source of sanctification? He's talking about sanctification, being made whole and holy because we were created for union. We were created for intimacy, we were created to be people who experience this kind of love. And so, Paul is saying here, you must submit to one another in this kind of love. The husband is the head of the wife, right? Verse 23, the husband is the head of the wife. This is another one that trips people up because we don't know what to do with this word. Sometimes we think like the head like a CEO. What does this mean? And so this word in the Greek is a word that Many times in the scripture, like 240 times, most of those, over 220, I don't remember the exact number, most of those, this word means this, physical head that's sitting on my shoulders. And a few of the times it means source, right? So the head or the source that he's talking about, like Jesus Christ is the head of the church. So what he's saying to husbands is radical for that day. What he's saying to them is you are to be the source of love and nourishment to your wife as Christ is the source of love and nourishment to the church. This was not an expectation to be discussed in Roman society. And so Paul is saying you are to be the source of love and nourishment. And the word love is here about five times when it comes to the responsibility of husbands. So in their culture, it was don't just rule over her. That's not the way of Jesus. It is love her and submit to her as well as she submits to you. So, verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So these comparisons 
between marriage and what's going on with Christ in the church. It's the very same idea of what Christ is doing with his church is sanctifying us, preparing us for the fullness, the restoration, the shalom that he created us for, right? In the Free Methodist Commission on Doctrine, they wrote, faithful Christians had only to remember what it meant for Jesus to be head. This is in reference to what Paul's writing. The first is the last, the Lord of all was, is the servant of all, and the master of the household washes feet. All these suggest a husband's headship must reflect that of Jesus, with no trace of self-serving power and privilege. In fact, headship itself is turned on its head so that headship looks like submission. This mutual submission, a life of self-giving love, this is the beauty that Paul is calling them to in their relationships. And so he says, in the same way, husbands also ought to love their wives as their own bodies. This is a significant statement that we've picked out each of the three weeks, right? Jonathan, love David as himself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Husbands, love your wives as yourself, right? This is the call of a committed Christian. I remember a point, um, and I wrote about it in my journal at the time because I sensed God was teaching me something significant. But Dave and I aren't like the arguing, yelling type. Um, when we get into disagreements, it's more like this sense of frustration with one another. And um, there's not a lot that brings us to that point of frustration. But one of the things, I don't dig my heels in about a lot, honestly, I just don't care that much. But when it came to our kids, I was often convinced I was right. And so there was a time when we were having this disagreement, this argument over our kids. And in that moment of like heated exchange with him and trying to convince him that I was right, I clearly sensed the Holy Spirit saying, Kay, this, crucify the flesh. Submit to your husband because you trust me. Submit to your husband because you trust me. And so I was like, all right, I'm just going gonna, gonna to go away, and I'm going to trust that we're going to figure out how to work this out. I don't need to exert my opinion. I don't need to be right here. I don't need to say, I'm the one who knows better because I'm with the kids all the time. I'd said that many times before. Dave could attest to that. And instead, I thought, I can trust Jesus in this situation. I can trust Jesus in this situation, and that leads me to trust my husband. And so I just, I said, okay, okay. I, and I said, I, I don't want to argue with about this. I, I want to let you figure it out. And Dave came back to me later and said, I want to figure this out in a way that makes you comfortable as well. But I didn't know that's what was going to happen when I felt like it was literally like, stuffing, like shoving a knife in my chest to not be right. I didn't know that that was going to be the response from Dave, but I trust Jesus because I know Dave also trusts Jesus. And so it was one of those moments where God taught me clearly, very practically, that there is this blessing, there's this goodness when we actually give up control, trying to exert ourselves in these relationships and instead submit ourselves to Jesus and then to one another. Right? One of the reasons why wives are so often disrespectful is because they're trying to make their way known, trying to get their way, right? And so that goes two ways. Husbands also trying to exert their power and get their way. This is not the way of Jesus. And so this is the beautiful picture that we get to be face-to-face -face pursuing purpose together, reclaiming the blessing that was given to us in the garden in these marriage relationships. And so Paul concludes in this passage with the mystery of the gospel. In the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, 
He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. The lesson for us, church, is if we want to grow in goodness and glorify God, we do this by seeking union through mutual submission. This is what truly unites us. There's not an oppression. There's not some dynamic that we're always fighting about. Instead, we seek union through mutual submission. Love one another. In that same article I was quoting, it was written that when Paul had finished, it was as though we humans, now participants in the new creation, find ourselves standing once again in a garden where God's own self-sacrificing love offers us an opportunity for two to become truly one flesh. This is the purpose of marriage, so that we get a taste of the goodness. And I know people in this room that have these kinds of marriages that become a witness to the blessing and the goodness that God intended for people, the blessing and the goodness that is available for you today. If you acknowledge, I do have this sin in my life. I confess it and I need Jesus to save me from the power of that sin, from the curse that this world is under. I need Jesus. That's available to you today. And I invite you to receive it this morning as we respond in worship. And for the rest of you who have known Jesus and have been trying to work this out, I just want to come back to the fact that a good marriage is not the point. Because many of us aren't married in this room. A good marriage is something that glorifies God by seeing mutual love, honor, union, intimacy, all these things we've talked about lived out in one of the hardest relationships you ever have. That's tasting the goodness of God and allowing other people to taste it through your relationship. It's a beautiful thing. Dave doesn't exist to make me happy. I don't exist to make Dave happy. But when we love each other selflessly, when we are self-giving in the way that we love each other, God is pleased. God is glorified. And so this is our goal. This is the purpose, right? That God would be glorified in these relationships. And it's hard. I'm not saying it's, it's not hard. But there is a way to be empowered by the Spirit, to be receptive to the Spirit, and obedient for us to live this out together. As we get ready to go into a time of worship, responding to the word of God today, for those of you who are married in the room, I just encourage you, ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart today, the ways in which you could really step into the true purpose for marriage. Maybe to open your eyes to the ways you thought marriage was something different, was for something different. And for those of you who are not married in the room today, your life is all about the very same thing, growing in goodness and glorifying God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of marriage. We thank you for the beauty that you created us to experience in that. Lord, we long for shalom. We long for real harmony in this world, for unity, for peace, for love. And so, Lord, would we be witnesses of that in our marriages? We pray, God, that you would continue to do an amazing thing in and through the people of the Arbor Church. In Jesus' name, amen.